nitty gritty of vertebrate paleontology. So this is where we're gonna try to just like really quickly and I hope effectively and with the space and time for you to have curiosity and questions, get into like where fossils come from. A lot of what we talked about are in our first and only meeting so far on Tuesday, big pictures, big ideas, amazing patterns, biodiversity. But at the end of the day, all of paleontology and what paleontology can contribute to science and our understanding of the history of life on earth comes from fossils. And fossils are like literally objects. We call those objects specimens that you like find in the ground. So every fossil comes from like a specific place in a specific rock. And so these like really, really gorgeous hills that you're seeing here are down in Arizona, wonderful colors. All those different colors are indicative of different chemical environments inside what is mostly a stack of mudstones that's preserving like a swamp from hundreds of millions of years ago. And if you were to climb up and down on those hills, some of those layers have bones and wood and things like that in them. And so how do we go from amazing living ecosystems of the past that we'll never really know everything about all the way through the process of becoming a fossil, us finding a fossil, and then us using a fossil to like try to interpret and basically like rebuild what that ecosystem must have been like. That's kind of the idea of this lecture, some of those basic points to get you guys, if you haven't been thinking about all these disparate ideas, paleontology is so interdisciplinary and so integrative, we have to hit on a bunch of different topics. So today we're talking about fossils, rocks, and time in paleontology. And so the first thing we're gonna do is take you guys back, you maybe, I don't even think likely, but like maybe when you were in middle school or elementary school or probably high school, somewhere you got some version of the rock cycle, right? There's water cycles, there's rock cycles. You guys probably heard words like an igneous rock, a sedimentary rock, maybe? If you haven't, that's definitely okay. So this is a nice schematic diagram. I think it's pretty simple. It's not the simplest diagram you'll ever see in your life. A pretty simple diagram of the rock cycle. So that gray line going across the middle is supposed to be like the surface of the earth. And then you guys are all adults and can read, I assume. So you can see all these different arrows pointing to different kinds of rocks, the processes that change rocks. I think you guys saw it in the reading from Tuesday. One of the things that's so important about a knowledge of like Earth's past and just like the planet you live on is that it's always changing. Rocks weren't formed and then they sit there. They're constantly being formed. They're constantly being destroyed. It's all process. It just happens at a really long time scale. So what I wanna have happen right now is you guys spend really like a good few minutes talking to your neighbors, make some observations, make some interpretations. What about this makes sense to you? What about this makes you go like, uh, I don't get what they're talking about. I don't know what that means at all. I've never heard of any of these words, which is definitely okay. Okay, go ahead. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
All right, can I get some groups, just like observations, questions, anything? I'm hearing a lot of good stuff, so I'm, I'm pleased. Yes. Um, we were curious. Um, so, like, there's this thin bar as the first third bed. Yes. What it, so, what constitutes that? Oh, that's action? interesting. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of this diagram, of course, nothing about this is meant to be like to scale. Like a sedimentary rock can form in a lake. It doesn't have to go deep under the Earth's crust to become one. This is very much just diagrammatic, well, generally given. You, I think it literally yeah, means like the. Sometimes, right? So you guys can think about it like if you go to um, Hawaii or if you go to like the Tetons, you're walking around on the dirt, that's not rock, that's the surface, but then you hit that front of those mountains, which are a bunch of metamorphic rock that have been thrust up really high. So you have like a place on the surface there where you have like pretty recent sediment and soil and life hitting against like hardcore real rock bedrock. So a word you guys might hear is like the bedrock. Like Pocatello sits in a valley where the mountains are bedrock and there's bedrock underneath all the dirt that all of our like Fred Meyer and highways are sitting on for the most part. So if you go down, right, you're gonna hit a layer of like more solid, true bedrock. And that's super variable all over the surface of the earth. Yeah. This is again, very a cartoony kind of thing just to get the big ideas across. What other observations people have? Yeah. Uh, less of an observation more than like what I would like to know. Yeah. Time lines, like how long does it? Oh, yeah. Well, some of it is like you know, uh, some sands and rocks can be like really, really, really soft. So, like, famously, uh, complex and ever changing ecosystems like beaches can form like sands and even sandstone layers that, like, in the matter of years, can form and then erode again away. They're not very strongly cemented to each other, but they can form and fall apart really quickly. Like, on a human time scale, we can see it happening. Other things happen uh, really, really, really slowly. How long does it take an ocean plate to go under California and make Mount Rainier or Mount Shasta pop its top? Long time, millions and millions of years, because the continent's moving, and uh, from our perspective, slowly. And that's what's driving a lot of these cycles. Why the arrows are moving at all, for the most part, is because Earth has an active surface with a crust turning <laughs> around and crashing into each other. What other things? Yeah. Uh, notice that the sedimentary rock be formed from chunks of different types of rock. Yeah. So like chunks of sediment or chunks of metamorphic or chunks of uh, igneous. So one thing that humans do, because we just can't help ourselves, is make like low cute categories so we can understand nature and be like, I get it, I'm safe. The world is knowable. But really, one of the things I want you guys to take away from this completely is that rocks turn into each other all the time. If I'm gonna be like a totally like weirdo and choose something, I'm gonna say igneous rocks are like extremely pure. It's like the melted form of just all these elements and minerals down in the earth that when they come up, only when they cool down do they like form a rock. But if a volcanic rock, an igneous rock, like becomes part of a mountain and then gets rained on and turns into sediment, ends up in a river, eventually that like igneous rock turns into a sedimentary rock. And the same is true for everything. All these kinds of rocks, all these little categories, sedimentary rocks included, can uplift, meaning they're like exposed, they're not buried anymore. Like all, all mountains are being uplifted and then we call it outcrop. When there's exposed rock, those pretty hills I showed you on the title slide, that's called outcrop. And then any kind of outcrop, doesn't matter if it's a volcano, doesn't matter if it's much of limestone, if it erodes, it becomes sediment and in some way becomes a sedimentary rock. You force that sedimentary rock under a continent or into a trench or something, it might turn into metamorphic rock or that metamorphic rock get bounced back up and it'll all erode again. The point is, it's like, this is what's happening. It's crazy. It's a cycle that has no like, natural starting point and end point really in a way that's meaningful for especially for this class. So I don't want to belabor this. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'm glad you guys said it. Anything, if you melt it, becomes magma. And if you pop that magma, it becomes lava, right? Um, and every kind of rock has a way to get to every other kind of rock. So any permutation you can imagine, we can probably find a place on earth where we could like talk about it. And if this was geology, we would do that, but it's not. And so we're gonna, not going to do that too much. Just to give you guys a little bit of uh, a baseline, things I think are just kind of interesting human factoids I'd like you to have. There are these three big kinds of rocks, igneous rocks, that really means volcanic rocks. 
For the most part in this class, we're going to be talking about continental surfaces. So the major plates of our planet that are continental above the water level, and they're not always above the water level, but continental plates. 50% of the continental surface of the earth is igneous rock, but almost all of the ocean crust in the world, the bedrock of the oceans, which is a huge amount of the world, is that igneous rock. That is what it is. When you guys watch the lectures that I'll upload today about like the early universe and the formation of our planet, igneous is kind of like the default. Lava and magma is what it all comes from. Metamorphic rock, this is any kind of rock, could be igneous, could it be sedimentary. All that happens is you make it really, really hot and under really, really extreme pressure. So really br uh, pretty interesting rocks, neat gneisses, marbles. These are pretty things that because they're under such intense heat and pressure, they can like chemically change. They usually become denser, harder. And about 12% of the continental surface is metamorphic rock. Really often that's mountain ranges are the metamorphic rock exposed. But what we care about in this class, and honestly, what I actually want you to take away, is what we're going to be talking about is fossils, and fossils are almost always found in sedimentary rocks. And so sedimentary rocks sound like what they are called. Sand getting put under a certain amount of pressure, a certain amount of heat, a certain amount of burial, becoming a sandstone. The same thing can happen to mud, can become a mud stone. And maybe in that sand, maybe in that mud, organisms are preserved, their bodies, parts of their bodies, and that gets preserved as a fossil. Interestingly, organic material, living organisms, also can form whole categories of what we call sedimentary rocks. We talked on Tuesday about coal. You have to have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of plant matter that get buried and go deep in the earth, like at least deep like under the surface. They will get pressurized and heated up and they will form literally their carbon into a rock that we call coal. Limestone is the exact same kind of thing, but mostly formed from like marine animals. Sometimes they're planktonic animals. Sometimes they're literally things like corals and shells that like if they get buried and if they go down, their corpses, their little bodies will make limestone, which counts as a sedimentary rock. So there's biological sedimentary rocks and then anything else eroding might bury things. And that's all called sedimentary rocks. Most of the surface of the continents, when you walk around, and this probably shouldn't be too surprising, the continents are floating up high above this churning lava nightmare that we all live on. Most of the continental surface is sedimentary rock. So here's that little diagram for you guys. Um, again, we're not gonna talk about this like too much at all. This just isn't the class for this. But continental crust is much thicker than oceanic crust, but it's less dense and so it tends to float. And so that's just like a little pattern we have here where we're all living our little happy lives underneath all this stuff that's going on. Not gonna focus on it too much. What I care about you guys having in your hand is an understanding of rocks, that rocks are always changing and the fossils come from sedimentary rocks. Do any questions about any of this? Okay. One question that can't come up enough. If, uh, we are doing a public event at the museum. If you guys are talking to your friends about fossils, one of the things people always wanna know is how do you know how old stuff is? How do you know how old a rock is? There's actually a lot of really different ways we can do that. Um, we're going to talk about this as a process called dating, how we're dating anything that we want to be talking about. And there's two kinds of like categories of dating we can talk about. One is absolute dating. That means like, I know exactly how old this thing is. And so how absolute dating works is we get it from chemistry. We get it from people who study like nuclear physics. It has nothing to do with geology. It has nothing to do with paleontology. It's literally physics. So you guys probably know, if you remember your chemistry, that any atom has a certain number of protons, certain number of electrons, and usually there's the same number of neutrons and protons in the atom of whatever element it is. So carbon has got six uh, protons and six neutrons, and it's got that atomic mass of 12. Are you all like having like gross flashbacks, like right? <laughs> but there are, you might remember, isotopes. Times when some amount of carbon atoms have maybe more neutrons than they usually do. So that's called carbon-14. That carbon atom is heavier because it's got two extra neutrons, but chemically it's still a carbon. It still has the same positive and negative, still has the same electrons, still interacts as if it's a normal carbon. It just actually is a teeny bit heavier. So isotopes are naturally occurring. They're usually unstable. There's a reason most carbon is carbon-12 and there's 12, uh, six protons, six neutrons, but isotopes always are out there naturally occurring and we can use to our advantage the fact that those things are unstable to learn about the world, which is really cool. So let's say you have, if I go back to that rock slide uh, cycle, an extrusive volcanic event. So in this case, this volcano is absolutely puking out a whole bunch of lava. That lava is gonna cool and solidify. It's gonna crystallize. 
So inside that piece of igneous rock, which itself is made of minerals, a rock is a big old collection of minerals, minerals are collections of elements, there's these little pieces. Some of those pieces, not most of them by any means, but some of them are these things called zircons. Zircon is one of these mineral crystals we can use to date. Inside this crystal, which only forms as that lava cools down and solidifies, it makes like a little prison. And inside that crystal are all kinds of elements that were inside this lava. And what's cool is once that crystal forms, it locks everybody in. So however many of like the natural proportion out in the world of like uranium weirdo isotopes there are, lead isotopes, strontium isotopes, any kind of isotope you could think of is now trapped. And so we can use that to our advantage because people who study nuclear physics, absolutely not me, who knows almost really nothing about this except how I can use it. There's a certain rate at which if you take a sample from a crystal say, but it could be anything, where there's a certain number of atoms that have we call the parent isotope, which is like that unstable isotope. Let's say it's carbon-14. And as time goes by, just naturally, in a stochastic, probabilistic way, those isotopes are going to default back down to the normal, not crazy isotope. So carbon-14 becomes carbon-12, and there's a lot and a lot of other examples. That happens in a predictable, measurable way. You couldn't look at an individual atom and say, I can guess when that one's going to go back to normal and not be an isotope anymore. But what you can do is when you have all of the huge sample that's trapped in there at the atomic level, you can probabilistically get an idea of how long since that crystal prison got formed, which is super, super, super interesting. We call this a half-life when about half of the isotopes have gone back to that kind of more natural state. And so this is something, again, like I said, that has nothing to do uh, in terms of its uh, mechanisms and uh, like the bedrock science underneath it. This is all nuclear physics, but we as paleontologists and lots of other people can use that to our advantage. And so there's these things that people now know. We have these really, 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 really hilariously well calibrated and exact measurements. Uranium 238 will naturally decay to lead 206 and it takes 4.47 billion years for half of them to do that. Uranium-235 will become lead-207. That only takes 700 or 10 million years for half of them to do that. The reason this is interesting to you is each one of these naturally occurring processes that is measurable by nuclear physics, you could take the same crystal and test it for these lead isotopes and then test it for strontium and then test it for a bunch of others that have very different half-lives. And if they all give you, because of whatever their proportions are, this thing, this crystal is 71.3 million years old. Strontium says that, lead says that, whatever. You can be really confident that this piece of volcanic rock is 71 million years old. That's super, super spectacular, I think. Does that make sense to everybody? One thing that's really cool, we are going to talk about what gets dated here in a second. You guys probably, when you think of radiometric dating, when you hear of radiometric dating, which is what this is called, you think of carbon dating. Everyone has heard of carbon dating before. Carbon has a half-life of like five and change thousand years. So you go down the curve to where you have like a kind of really hard to measure number of original like carbon-14 oddball isotopes really quickly. So we actually can't carbon date a bone if it's more than 40 or 50,000 years old. It's like not possible anymore. So you guys have heard of carbon dating. Carbon dating is used in archaeology and history, mummies and early agriculture or whatever. Very cool for carbon dating. But almost all of the fossil record, carbon dating doesn't help. It's too recent. You have to use these bigger, crazier elements to do that. Okay. That's absolute dating. So taking like a volcanic rock, an ash or a lava and getting an exact age for it. What's really actually true out in the world when it comes to fossils, because we cannot carbon date a dinosaur bone or an ancient you know, fossil trilobite. You can't do the direct dating of the thing. You have to date the rocks. And so geologists are going out in the world, and let's say these are the rocks on the side of a hill. Here's a layer that has volcanic ash that you can get a date from, maybe it's 7 million years. There's a layer that has seashells in it, another volcanic ash that you can date, a layer that has bone in it. That's what the real world is when it comes to dating fossils, is dating the rocks layers kind of usually close to, above and below the fossils. So go ahead and talk to your neighbors for a second. 
If you had to tell somebody in a defensible way how old those seashells were and how old that bone is, what can you say? What can't you say? Okay, go talk to each other. Okay, uh, I'll bring you guys back in. Uh, who wants to let us know what their group's talking about? What are the things we can say about the age of these fossils? Because we really only care about the fossils. I know it's not overly complicated. I just need somebody to do it. Yeah. The shells aren't going to be any older than something years ago. Okay. The older. So they can't be older, at least here on this hillside. They can't be older than seven, and they can't be younger than three. Do we like that? Like we have a four million year range of how old these shells are. Maybe that's okay for what you're interested in. Maybe that really is unhelpful because four million years is kind of a long time. Okay, what about the bone? Less than three. Maybe it's 2.99999, maybe it's 0.8 million, right? All you know is that it's not older than three on this hillside. So what of course happens in the real world is you don't go to one hillside and say, got it. You go to other hillsides. So let's say you went across the basin and you like stopped at McDonald's and then after lunch, you like went to another hillside and collected more fossils and more volcanic ashes. It's the same kind of rocks, the orange and the blue, same kind of fossils. What can you guys say now about the ages of these things? All right, what additional things can be said? I want to be clear that I base this off a real example, and it's like not supposed to be like, oh, now it's easier because we know more. It's actually probably not easier, but it's real. So what can we say now that we have two sections, geological sections with fossils and dates in it? What can we say? Yeah. You can uh, narrow down your confidence about how old the ones are. Okay, so what, give me just any concrete example of that. So that found in the second image is between 2.1 and 0.9. Okay. So this was like, all I know is that it's old, younger than 3 million years. 
Now you know, okay, it's probably younger than two and a half, one million years, and actually probably older than 0.9 million years. So there's a tightening of the window on the bone, the animal bone. How about the shell situation? I think one thing that you might ask from seeing something like this is if, I mean, you think the organism persisted for a longer period of time, right? Because there are two, there's evidence of that same organism in two different regions. Of the shell, yeah, 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 and sure. maybe something occurred, but it persisted. Mm -hmm. So you know it was around for that entire team, but these particular individuals are from 3.8 to 4 million and 2.1 to 3 million. Yeah, you're getting a little more of a specific range about this. What's interesting is like, let's say you care about fossil snails. If you start to get two, six, 40 more sections, and you have maybe 4 million years of time that these snails did live, once you get that kind of resolution, you can maybe talk about evolution within that snail species, which is really cool, and that's what people do. This was not meant to be satisfying or like, okay, everything works now. This is just meant to give you guys a little bit of an idea. Relative dating, is where you're doing your best to correlate. And so actually a lot of people who do geology now do what's called stratigraphy now when they're mapping different rock sections and trying to correlate them. They actually use like all kinds of really cool computer modeling and probabilistic like AI kind of stuff to get a really good estimation of like the whole sequence of rocks with thousands of little layers. It's very cool. But I hope you can at least appreciate the difference between an absolute date and exactly how old this thing is and a relative date where I know it's here-ish. And that's all valid, it's just different. Okay, we're gonna switch gears absolutely, positively, completely from rocks and talk about fossilization. You guys, for the most part, not all of you necessarily, but for the most part, you guys are biologists, bio majors, uh, bio grad students. When you think of an organism, doesn't matter uh, what kind of organism it is. In this case, we're gonna use an iguana from Central America. If you think of an organism as a scientist, there are, Things that are knowable about an organism, there are things that are not knowable about an organism. So I want us to take many minutes here, we'll put stuff up here on the board, talk to people around you, try to be exhaustive, try to run out of things. What is knowable about this lizard on this branch? As a scientist, what could you learn about it? Okay, talk to each other, please. <laughs> You know, Assume you can do anything. Yeah. 
Is it camouflage? It's really matched. Or three bottles. That's what it looks like. You know, you know, but you know, you could like, yeah, we talk about it's like, you know, what are you facing it all? You know, like, it's like, just this one that we can't do that. Well, maybe it's just one that we can't do that. Well, that works for like that. It's kind of hard to understand where it's like, where it's like, it's a little bit of a habit. Yeah, it's a scary area. 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 Maybe also spend a minute. What's unknowable about this iguana? Like we can know this provided they just say like, well, oh, yeah. they might have to oh, yeah. like what are they afraid of like oh two conditions on like where is Dan not Sometimes a lot of what people do in animal biologists, they do stomach pumping. You catch all these trout, you force them to puke up, and you're like, this one's eating all caddis flies. This one's eating all benthic snails. So it's different even within a species then. So diet, also, by the way, observation. Yeah. you can watch them do that. Animal diets are super labile. Lions eat grass. Giraffes sometimes eat meat and bone, and it's not always the cleanest as you might expect. We have these dietary categories. Okay, what else? There's, okay, there's t tons of ways to know. Wow, that was bad. But you know what I'm talking about. Ways to know diet. What else? Habitat. Habitat. You know, you just saw it in the tree, in this jungle, in this part of the world. Okay. So habitat, a lot of specifics about habitat. Very, very specific. If you look at this iguana, and then look at all the other iguanas that are in that species, you get the idea of its range, its preferences. Maybe some of them live in the desert population wise, maybe none of them, maybe they're all wet forests or something like that. It's getting into their habitat, their range. Absolutely right. What other things? How it mates. How it mates, yeah, so reproductive, all kinds of things. If you guys, if you think about biology, reproduction is insane. The way that manifests itself in animal and plants. Phenotypes 
not only like how they create gametes, how they attract mates, how they disperse those gametes or exchange those gametes, how those gametes get used, usually by females, but it can be by anybody, to make babies, how those babies are grown in very different ways, how those babies are raised safely. This is a lot here, and you could know almost all of it for an iguana. So that's interesting. What else? Social behavior. Social, social, social stuff. So what do you mean by that? Um, I'm gonna write social life. <laughs> yeah. Guana. You guys know about wizards and their push-ups when they get mad, yeah. right? <laughs> so you can know this thing, be used in territorial or whatever else. What else? Senses, I or hearing or smell. Yeah, how's it sensory world? What are the kind of lines of evidence we can use to understand like an iguana's sensory world? See if can. That's not just my side. Certain people do experiments on these things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You can look at proteins in the eyeball to understand like what colors are even able to be seen. That's how we know things about like dogs being like dichromatic, whereas we're trichromatic. There are different levels of being able to see. It doesn't mean dogs can't see certain colors like some people think, but it means it's different somehow. That's knowable. Sense of smell, sense of taste, sense of hearing, really details of like how the ear ossicles vibrate, low frequency sounds, high frequency sounds, what a bat can hear versus what an elephant can hear. It's all very knowable. Yeah. Or at least parameterizable. We can get it into a range. You guys know dog whistles, right? You can blow them and you're like, I don't hear anything, and your dog's freaking out. It's because we've made them to go up to the dog range. So we know we can do that. What else? Oh, yeah. It's life, but how old is it going to be? I'm going to say you could know about this iguana, how old it is right now, as well as you could figure out if you wait around how long it actually will live, how long its species maybe usually lives in terms of a healthy uh, untaxing, a healthy growing up and a healthy adulthood. How long is the natural life of an iguana? If there's not a harpy eagle or something else to eat it up. What else? Yeah. Height and weight. Height and weight, like basic like, like measurements you take at the doctor's office. I'm going to say doctor measurements. <laughs> how about, like, even beyond diet, how about all those ecological interactions? What it eats, what eats it, what are its parasites? Who, who's on those, who's under those scales? Who's sucking that blood? Maybe nobody, maybe a lot of things. So I'm going to say, like, it's an ecological footprint, how it fits into the food web, how it fits into the... Um, Habitat it does live in. What's unknowable about this climate? <clears throat> yeah, Chrissy? It's soft. Yeah, what's it thinking about? <laughs> Is it mad at the cameraman? Does it wonder if the cameraman has like a mango in his pocket? We don't know. We don't know. Okay, so thoughts, dare I say feeling? <laughs> Thought and feeling, post created or initiated manifestations of certain levels of cognition. Does the iguana get there? I can't say I know it's not true. Uh, we can sort of with a smile on our face say hope and dream. I mean, animals have instincts to do things. I mean, do you guys know how gopher tortoises like disperse on the islands around Florida and in the Caribbean? These are tortoises, and like it's been documented. It's not even like there's too many tortoises on the island, but individuals will go to the beach and they pull in their legs and they just sit there. They look at the ocean. You can watch it on YouTube. They'll sit there for like the whole day, like eight hours. And then eventually they just stand up again, walk into the ocean and pull their legs in again and they float like a coconut and hopefully they'll land on a different island. <laughs> What's that turtle doing? <laughs> We're never going to know. You can make all kinds of cool things. Oh, it's dispersing. It's new, new habitat. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that turtle's just feeling it. Grizzly bears have been documented like staring at the sunset like statistically more than should ever be normal. <laughs> if you go to see Idaho, look at the grizzly. She goes like this every evening and looks up at Kinport and watches the sunset. And you're like, that's a bear watching the sunset. So I don't know. Stuff's going on. What else? That was a real off the rails. Sorry, I did that. But what else? Are there other things that are every detail of this individual life? On oh, this well, unless you're watching it 24 7 from when it was before. Yes, details of its life. Injuries that have healed, maybe, right? Injuries that have healed. Um, yeah, how many children is this? If this is a male iguana, how many children does he have? Maybe you, maybe you met him when he's eight, so you have no idea how many, how much reproductive success he has or hasn't had. 
Point is, there's a lot you don't know and would be impossible to know if you just met this iguana when he was aware, eight years old. Okay, that's really helpful. Using this as a base, but it's only a base. This is a fossil lizard, almost the exact same size. It's 48 million years old from Wyoming. It's a fossil, also knowable, different kinds of knowing. Talk to each other, you can use that list. Like I said, you also are welcome to think of other things. What's knowable about this animal? If we can all agree that in fact, those rocks are absolutely for sure a lizard. Okay. <laughs> So All right, I'll pull you guys back in. What are some things that are knowable about Saniwa, which is a cool <laughs> lizard from Wyoming 48 million years ago? What are some things knowable about Saniwa? Well, as we were talking about it, in their bone structures might be very similar. So we could determine the sex of, of a local lizard. Maybe. So we're already talking about the fact that what you are not completely, but mostly reduced, in quotes, reduced to here is a skeleton. There is some soft tissue, actually. You guys see there's like staining. There is some soft tissue there. But so a good idea here in the front is, could we get after things like sex? In some animals, I think that's extremely plausible. Other animals, it might be more difficult. I actually don't know off the top of my head if it's possible with a lizard like this. But there are some animals that is possible from them. So maybe, maybe we could do that. What other things? We can infer its diet. How do you infer its diet? Um, teeth, maybe what's around. Uh, what Lots else? of ways to know diet uh, in the modern world. And the fossils, so teeth morphology, right? 
So Miwa has a mouth full of extremely sharp blade teeth, and that's all it has in its mouth. Isotopic analysis. Isotopic analysis, what does that mean? Uh, so you can look at the, at the levels of different carbon isotopes to infer like what, um, to get, get an idea of like what specifically it was eating. So for example, was it eating, um, if, if it was a blade of teeth, might have been, might have been predator, was it, okay, what types of animals was it eating? Uh, was it eating so we'll talk about this. Range, we'll talk about this as we get into class a lot more. But one of the things that's really modern in paleontology is using, like Henry's talking about, isotopes. So you can actually say, like, this gigantic ocean monster, like the one from Jurassic World, all the isotopes tell you it's at the top of the food chain. You can look at its body size, you can look at its teeth, and be like, this thing's a big predator. You can actually do the isotopes in the enamel of its teeth, and it'll be like, this thing's only eating other predators. It's like, nice lines of evidence, everybody. So isotopes, what else? If it happens to preserve gut contents. Sometimes fossils have stuff right here. There's really famous examples of like a dinosaur, and then there's a crocodile inside of its rib cage, and you're like, I think you got eight <laughs> to that crocodile. So gut contents. All right, what other things are knowable besides diet? Or at least we can put parameters around diet. What else? You can do some doctor measurements. Yeah, of course you could. Like you could can you could you guys tell me how long this lizard is? Yeah. Yeah. Because you gave me a pretty reasonable, I bet, estimate of its mass based on living lizards. Yeah, I bet you you could. So I bet a lot of this. Yeah. What else? Maybe a little bit of the sensory world. Like you were talking about mm -hmm. the complexity of the ear, if that's something that's reflected in the skeleton. So some of your senses are bony, like your hearing. It's very, very, very knowable from bones. Things like your sense of smell and your sense of sight, to a lesser extent, are knowable. But what's interesting, and we're going to talk about this in class, is animals in their brains, the size of different parts of the brain helps us serve kind of a proxy for those different things. Some animals have huge olfactory loads. In the modern world, we look at fossils and we're like, wow, this animal's got bad eyesight and really good sense of hearing because of this and this in the brain. And then maybe ecologically that makes sense. So there's ways to get at it. Yeah, I would say that's true. What are some things that are not knowable? Like that are knowable for the iguana? We get color from Sinewa. Maybe someday, right now, no one knows what color it was. That iguana is orange and brown and black and green. It's awesome. It's an iwa. Get your colored pencils out. You can do different parts. Details of the skin. Yeah, not so much. Because it's a lizard, we have a really good idea of what skin it's supposed to have. But we don't know for sure. Genome? Nope. No. Species? <clears throat> Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to be really lost if we can't do that part. That'd be really bad. Habitat and rain. What do we know about this animal's habitat? No, it lived and died near a lake and so I know it's dead in a big lake from 40 million years ago in what's now Wyoming. Like, that's a real data point. What's the range of this taxon? Absolutely have no idea because I would need to have fossils from 40 million years ago that go all over North America and eventually stop different directions. We don't have that. We have but this one. Look at, you can look at the lithology and the plants that it lived alongside to get an idea of what the habitat was. And yeah. Then, you could probably get a really good idea of habitat and maybe even approximate expectations for things like its range. Sure. But like the fossil itself comes from a time and a place. Reproduction, I don't know. Social life, I don't know. Ecological footprint, ways to get after it, sure. I definitely agree with all these being unknowable still. <laughs> things like lifespan is interesting. We'll talk about that. There's ways to cut up bones and view an animal's growth. And so you could probably cut that femur and get a really good idea. Like this knee was four. I bet you wouldn't be hard. No one's done it because this is a really pretty one and no one wants to cut it. <laughs> so this is a pretty possible, possible, fossil. And I just think this is a really important exercise to get you guys started because if we just jumped into this class and I was like, boom, early fish, boom, jaw evolution, you got to kind of be able to think about what's knowable and what's unknowable. And so there's this thing called the hierarchy of certainty. No one I know that's a paleontologist actually says it like this, <laughs> says the words hierarchy of certainty, but I think it's a really helpful framework for you guys to like keep in mind. We're gonna be talking about things where sometimes I, and hopefully you eventually, are like super confident. And other times we're like, yeah, maybe that makes sense. And so there's a level to these things. How do we know what we know from just bones, studying vertebrates, just bones and teeth? And so there's this first level you can think about as sort of the inevitable conclusions. So the body fossils, the trace fossils, we'll talk about what those are in a second, what they leave behind that let us, let us know that something is very knowable here. An example of that is like Saniwa's body length. We know it. <laughs> There's also things like likely interpretation. We can be scientists. We can take measurements on things we do know. We can do ground truthing in the modern world. Animals with teeth like this today always eat X. Okay, if I find teeth like that in the fossil record, pretty comfortable, likely interpretation. 
And there's also speculation. And I, honestly, sometimes half the fun in paleontology is that balance of speculation, how far out on that limb you're willing to go to talk about the thing you're finding. It's really fun. So let's talk about a couple of specific examples of that. Hierarchy of certainty wise, inevitable conclusions. On the right there is what we call a body fossil. A body fossil is any actual remains of the organism's physical form. Bones, skin impressions, teeth, shells, wood, all of those things are body fossils. It's literally the organism itself. This is a beautiful fossil of an ichthyosaur, a swimming reptile whose ancestor looked like a lizard that you guys, I think, probably think looks like a dolphin. It's spectacular. I am 100% confident that this species of ichthyosaur has a dorsal fin. Are you guys confident that this thing has a dorsal fin? It has bones that go into this part of its tail. It doesn't have bones on the top of its tail, but I'm really confident I know what its tail looks like. These are inevitable things because the preservation is so good. I can draw that ichthyosaur's body shape. Got it. That's a reptile that looks like a dolphin. Trace fossils can also give you inevitable conclusions. These are dinosaur trackways. For a long time after people first found dinosaurs, it's like, how do these things work? How do they move? How big are they? Are they just like lumbering around? Now that we have literally tens of thousands of places all over the world where you see them walking only on their back legs, I can find the skeleton of this animal and know that it's not like on all fours because literally nowhere do you find hand and foot, hand and foot as like the usual pattern. Sometimes of course your hand touches the ground, but for the most part, this is an upright animal that's walking on its back legs. I know that sounds kind of silly because you guys have seen dinosaurs about a million times in your life, but like it's cool that like a bone in the ground, we could be like, I know it's a biped for several different reasons. Okay, so that's a trace fossil. Trace fossils are not the animal's physical form. Eggshells, burrows, footprints, poop, those are things that are uh, trace fossils but can still give you inevitable conclusions. If you cut open a giant piece of dinosaur poop and it's full of like grass, you can be like, I think it's time to write grass and everyone's like, I think you're right. But there's a little bit of a sliding scale that I think is really fun. So let's go back to those ichthyosaurs. There's things we can say that are likely interpretations. Many, many, many of these German ichthyosaur specimens are preserved with what are interpreted as fetuses inside their body. A handful of them, always only, I don't think it gets ever more than four or five inside their abdominal cavity. This is a really famous specimen. It's probably because she, and it's pretty fun that we could say she, died and then the gas of her belly as she was rotting kind of pushed it out. This baby's most of the way out. We can see its big eyeball there sticking out. Interestingly, these babies always seem to be coming out tail first, which is exactly what whales do today because you can't come out head first because you can't breathe underwater. These are reptiles, just like whales are mammals. And so coming out tail first, just like whales do today with their babies, being pregnant, having live birth. It's a reptile with live birth. I bet if you surveyed all the paleontologists of the world, everyone would pretty much vote, I'm very comfortable with that. But it's still an interpretation because what we're doing here is finding skeletons with tiny versions of themselves inside their rib cage. Maybe they're all cannibals and these are all their food. There's a lot of reasons I don't believe that because these babies aren't processed or chewed up at all and they're mostly all together and they're all in one part of the abdomen. But I think we can say with a level of certainty, not as high as dinosaurs walk on their back legs, but with a certain high level of certainty, ichthyosaurs give live birth from a fossil. That's really cool. Other really more common examples that you guys see all the time and you don't even think about them because they're so in intuitive, things like this, all these different dinosaurs that have horns on their faces, big shields on their heads. I will never ever believe you if you tell me, I bet they don't fight each other and I bet they don't chase off their predators with them. I don't know that necessarily 100% for every species, but this is a pretty nice analog. So what we can do is take animals like whales with ichthyosaurs, maybe rhinos with horned dinosaurs to get ourselves at least on a starting point of how we are understanding the biology of the living versions of these fossils when they were living animals. So that's a like, you know, likely interpretations. And then finally get to categories like this, speculation. What color is that ichthyosaur? Maybe I know that's a marine reptile. I totally know what its body shape is. And I definitely think it probably gives birth to live babies. What color was it? The third grader asks. Well, that's hard to know. So we can speculate. Here's all these different drawings of ichthyosaurs. I think they're all valid. I don't really dislike any of them, but I can't tell you which one is the right one. Something that's really, really interesting, and the fact that science is always changing and always evolving, is that there was a paper that came out three or four years ago now, looking at, in really, 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 really excellently preserved fossils, the melanosome, the actual organelles in the cell that create pigment. And one of these ichthyosaurs, which is a big monster, it's this one, you can see how big it is, 
One of these ones that has a lot of skin in the preserved fossil was shown to be black top and bottom and front and back. So it's possible that this animal actually, we can be really confident. Maybe it wasn't black, maybe it was navy, maybe it was indigo, but it's a really, 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 really dark color. I think that makes it fantastic. It's like a sperm whale. It's out in the open ocean. It's a big predator. And it's probably really, really, really dark. At least it's one species. So there's levels here where we're going to move as science advances from speculation to likely to like, oh, no, we know that. Birds having feathers is a great example. And oh, sorry, dinosaurs having feathers. In the 60s, people are like, I bet dinosaurs have feathers. Everyone's like, uh. In the 90s, now there's fossils of it. And now there's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dinosaurs that we know that have feathers. So we've moved up in some of these categories, which is really interesting. All right, so this is to, uh, what you saw last time. Study of ancient life is paleontology and fossils of the preserved remains or impressions of organisms. And that's how we study paleontology to begin with. So let's talk about how fossils actually form. Um, here is an iguana. It's not the same iguana, thankfully, but still, it's dead. When we go from past ecosystems, functioning living world, to the fossil record, we have to go through a whole lot of filters. So let's take a minute here, talk to each other again. What will happen to the body of this iguana who's dead on the forest floor in Central America right now? What's gonna happen to all that information that you could have gotten? What happens next? Okay, go ahead and talk to each other. All right, what are some things that's going to happen to this iguana? Scavenging. Scavenging. What do you mean? Something's going to be like, oh, nice, and start eating this iguana. And probably many somethings, microbial somethings, insect somethings, other vertebrate animal somethings. Absolutely. And so that's going to be the default. This iguana looks like it's dead on the forest floor. There's a lot of ways to become a fossil, but I think what's really important for you guys to take in is that any individual becoming a fossil is hilariously unlikely. It's not even really worth thinking about. Think about every animal you've ever seen on the side of the highway. Not gonna become a fossil. It's in an exposed environment, it's scavenged, the road service comes along and throws it away, right? An animal dying and then entering the rock record of the earth and then surviving through that process and then being found by humans later, all of those steps are hilariously unlikely. There are something like 30-ish, like 35-ish really good Tyrannosaurus rex like skulls or partial skulls in the world. That animal lived for millions of years on a whole continent. We got 35 of them. That's the one everyone's looking for the most. So there were billions of T-Rex in Earth history as individuals. We got 35 as fossils and we're looking really hard. So think about how unlikely it is for any individual to become a fossil. So there's many steps. Each one is itself unlikely. And even if you do become a fossil, what's the chances you're ever gonna get collected by people? Super, 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 super low. Okay, I wanna take a quick break because I've been like badgering you guys for a minute. So let's just do like three, four minutes here instead of the usual five, because sorry. Um, yeah, stretch, stand up for a second and we'll finish up. Oh, no, I'm retired. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
All right, I'm going to pick back up. So this was a short break, and we will hopefully not be taking short breaks in the future. We'll do the full five. But all right, so getting into this process of taphonomy. Taphonomy is a whole like discipline within paleontology and geology of how fossils form. All the things that happen from the starting process of an animal dying to it being found by a human and put in a museum and studied. So that flamingo got caught by a hyena. I'm gonna say unlikely to become a fossil. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of processes. This is this classic diagram from the 1980s of people understanding the process of fossils ending up in museums. So you have the life assemblage, the living animals out on the plain. Through ecology in the modern world, or what we would call paleoecology in the past, there's predation, there's disease, there's death, and you have a death assemblage, the dead organisms, the remains on the landscape. And then there's all of these processes and all these words that you're totally not responsible for, but I'm putting up there so you can see it, of how we go through this process to get to a fossil. So these sheep bones out in the desert versus that flamingo, you know, there's maybe a higher chance that the sheep bones get fossilized because they're not in the mouth of a predator, but still super unlikely for both. And so after an animal dies, all these things happen to them immediately to almost everything to get in their way of ever becoming a fossil. They're disarticulated, they're damaged, they might get stepped on, they might get broken, they might get exposed like these sheep bones and the sun degrades them, they crack, they disintegrate, they fall apart. That is the fate of almost all organic remains on this planet. And so there's other ways things can happen though. The key, key, key thing to becoming a fossil is you have to get buried somehow and have that happen pretty quickly after your death. That is how you become a fossil. There's people, I think kind of funny people, who like want to be fossils themselves. So they go throw themselves in the river when they're dead or they say they want to in places where they're likely to get buried. <laughs> we don't have to talk about that. But you can imagine a dinosaur like this dying when it's still got most of its skin and muscles on it and then getting buried. There's a possibility that that dinosaur comes out the other end and is found as like an articulated or at least really well associated specimen, an actual individual. In most cases, most of the dinosaur bones, most of the bones of whatever you can think of in the fossil record are dissociated. The animal dies, it's in a river system for the heads, and the bones are washed around, pushed apart from one another. Some of them get buried, some of them become fossilized, some of them get found. The lion's share of fossils in museums are isolated bones or one or two bones, part of the leg of this elephant, part of the tusk but not the whole mammoth every time. That's really, really super rare. So you can see there's this moment where this duckbill dinosaur is dead, where we have like these possible paths. And for the most part, it's not gonna take either one. And so to form a fossil, you have to get buried. So I want you guys to talk to your neighbors just for a quick second here. If you're an organism on this landscape, and I know a lot of people talk about how much I'm included in this, like love these diagrams when you were in fourth grade of like what we call all these things on our planet. Organisms living on this planet, where are they getting buried? Where are they absolutely not getting buried? Talk to each other about that. So there was some animal that I don't know, 
All right, what are some ideas you guys have? And of course, you don't, I'm not, you don't have to be right. What are some ideas you guys have on where natural processes are likely to bury an animal or a plant or whatever? Talk about the alluvial fan. Ooh, alluvial. Did we even have that on there? Oh, up there. An alluvial fan. So, this is like sediment coming out off that glacier. This is actually another kind of alluvial fan. So, alluvial fans are like, wow, I don't want to get into what alluvial fans are. We'll talk about it later. But, yes, places that is where sediment's literally being deposited at the base of this glacier or here in this delta. That delta is an alluvial fan. It's sediment getting spread out by water, or up there, it's ice. So, probably getting buried in the delta. I like that. Where else? Lake. The lake, a lot of these water systems, right? The places you might, maybe, not even guaranteed, but you might get buried in a lake compared to out here in the middle of the grasslands, right? That's possible. Where are things not getting buried? The mountains. The mountains, huge. We call it the uplands in like paleontology, like hilly areas, and of course, mountain ranges. That is a place where erosion is happening. Sediments are being taken. Wind and rain are taking rocks, taking debris, and throwing it down the hill. You're not getting buried up on the side of a mountain. You're getting washed down that mountain. So something that's actually a real problem that all paleobiologists have to deal with is the whole record of like life on Earth, aka the fossil record, can almost be reduced to the fact that what it really is is a history of like this spot and this area. It's true. Like turtles and crocodiles have crazy good fossil records with thousands of species. It's because they live and die in environments that preserve them. Deserts, terrible fossil record. There are places where dunes can collapse and bury animals and they're really cool. Not the default. Mountains, really poor fossil record. So think of all the animals you guys know on earth. And then think about the ones that are like, they have relatives that live in the mountains that have crazy mountain adaptations. That's probably true of dinosaurs and all kinds of other animals too, and we're never going to find the mountain versions of some of those dinosaurs that definitely existed because there were definitely mountains. It's really frustrating. But so getting buried, you usually need moving water or at least active water stuff happening to move sediment around to actually be the thing to bury you. It could be a collapse. Maybe you're down here and this little sl slope just goes like that. You get buried, nice. Otherwise, you're in a lake, you're in a river. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And so here's like a really nice actual real photo of a river depositing sediment out here onto this beach. This is an alluvial fan. This is a delta, it's a very small one, where sediment's being deposited. So if you're as a little salmon or you know bear or something, you might wash up in here and get buried. There's a chance maybe you'll become a fossil. Honestly though, even if you get buried, it's super not likely, but maybe this is the spot it'll happen. Okay. So there's all these other things that happen once you even get into the death assemblage of animals and maybe you're getting buried. While you're in that river, the river is being a river. It's moving you around. It's throwing you around. There's these awesome fossil bone beds up in Canada of a herd of dinosaurs that is interpreted as all drowning in a big flash flood. It's very cool. But their bones are all disarticulated. There's not skeletons. There's just mountains of them spread like this with all the ribs and leg bones pointing in the same way because the flow of the current like oriented all the bones. So you don't know whose humerus is whose and whose femur is whose. There's all these really interesting things that you have to think about. I'm not gonna go through them all of ways that like how you were buried change what data we end up having on you. A lot of bones, a lot of fossils are beat up. They roll around in the river before they even get fossilized. That mammoth that was on the break slide, that's a, that's a mammoth from the Snake River, super beat up. It's just the teeth because those are tough and they can survive getting beat up. The skull's gone, the tusks are gone, the rest of the body's for sure gone. It's just the teeth are hard enough to survive. So these are all these different processes that get in the way. Sometimes though, burial can be really rapid. And when burial is rapid, it's really, really, really cool. We're gonna talk about some really great examples of that. A lot of the most famous fossils in the world are the rare ones. 
that got buried really fast. This is a beautiful, 100% complete fossil of a rhinoceros from Nebraska. It's 11 million years old. You guys, I think this is fun. We live in Idaho. The Yellowstone hotspot moved through what is now Idaho. There's a reason the whole Eastern Snake River Plain is a big flat thing that goes right to Yellowstone. <laughs> it's because that volcano is a hotspot that does not move and the continent moves over the hotspot. So where, whatever, uh, Burley is all the way up to where Yellowstone is, at different times, the Yellowstone hotspots erupted through there. If you guys go up to Island Park, you go into the old volcano when you go up into it. So 11 million years ago, Idaho popped its top because Yellowstone was under Idaho. And ash from that eruption went all over the continent. And there's this watering hole still preserved in Nebraska from 11 million years ago, where all the animals that were out living their little Great Plains lives got buried in volcanic ash and died right, right, right where they were standing from an Idaho eruption. It's very intense. If you're ever in Nebraska, I encourage you to go. It's very weird to imagine an animal standing in Nebraska and then because of a volcano in Idaho, it gets buried in multiple feet of ash, like in the sense that it can't even like run away, it gets buried that fast. It's a huge eruption. It's one of the times Yellowstone did really erupt. And so you can go to this place that Nebraska's built, it's a state park, and you can see all of these animals as they were when the ash started falling. So this is an example of burial happening hilariously fast in a matter of hours, probably. So what's really cool about that is that it preserves the whole habitat in situ. You can like see how many rhinos there are, you can see the birds, you can see the elephant things, and there's all these animals that are really different maybe than what you might expect from Nebraska today. Two of my favorites, if I can really quick, North American Great Plains had this animal that was a camel, that's functionally a giraffe. Over in Asia, giraffes are evolving long necks. We never get giraffes on this continent, but we do get some camels that are like, oh cool, and they do exactly what giraffes do. <laughs> Which I think is cool. The other thing that's fun is there are multiple female rhinos at that site that have twin calves next to them. And one thing that happens in some rhinos today is that there's actually a really high likelihood of twins in certain cases. And we just know that from modern rhino reproductive biology. And here's an 11 million year old, million year old rhino that absolutely like twins, 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 like multiple places. And so that same genetic thing is probably true back then. Really, really fun. Anyway, probably not what you think of when you think of Nebraska. But there's a place you can go. It's one teeny little snapshot on one continent and one time, place in time where you can see this watering hole of North America. When burial is rapid or at least like very stable, maybe the burial itself isn't like rapid in the sense of hours. Maybe it still takes a year or two, but the sediment's undisturbed and there's not things to decompose. Anoxic environments. The bottom of lakes are famous for this. There's no oxygen. So there's very few microbes to like dissolve and eat away at organic remains. A lot of these places are called Lagerstadt. Uh, it's a German word. There's plenty of ways to form a Lagerstadt. A Lagerstadt is this, one sedimentary layer with a really, really like almost hilariously good level of preservation. That lizard I showed you before, Siniwa, is from a different Lagerstadt from Wyoming. This is one from Germany from the Jurassic period. Look what is preserved here. It's more than just the bones. A lot of the soft tissue is preserved. This is a relative of things like stingrays. You can see the outline of like its whole body and its tail. The first pterodactyls were known from here. The first bird, Archaeopteryx, this is something that was found in the late 1800s that had everybody being like, uh, because it obviously has feathers on its hands and on its tail, but it also has a mouthful of teeth and it still has claws on its fingers. So the whole idea that dinosaurs and birds are somehow related goes back to the 1800s because people found this fossil and then they found like many more of this kind of animal, all from this lager style. So it's really cool. You can see it's not always the same, right? This is a little dinosaur that's like kind of decomposed a little bit versus this pterodactyl that's perfect or this archaeopteryx that's perfect. This little lizard relative is also looking pretty good. These are these really incredible ways that are not common that fossils can uh, give us these really incredible deeper insights than most fossils can give us. That's a longer style. And so, time is it here? Yeah, we can do this. We'll just bust through a couple different ways fossilization happens. What actually happens to form a fossil? So this right here might not look familiar to you guys. This is a cross section of bone, like the outside of your femur, the edge of your femur bone. This is the bony tissue. Here's the spongy part of the marrow. Here's where you have marrow in life on the inside of this hollow tube. But this is the actual side of your bone. Bone, you guys might not think of it like this. Bone is a living tissue. It is alive. There are nerves and blood vessels in it. It grows. It can break your bone. Your bone will heal. It's not some crystalline structure. It is organic. It is a living tissue. But you'll notice that all those blood vessels and all those nerves and all these other soft tissue parts of bone leave empty spaces. Most of what happens in fossilization is this bone gets buried. 
water in the ground, groundwater that's full of minerals, could be any kind of mineral, is flowing through that bone for thousands, maybe millions of years. And slowly but surely, all these little tiny in-between spaces where there used to be blood or there used to be nerves are filled in with these minerals. And you get this process called permineralization, where this bone is now very heavy because it's actually rock and the original bone in some cases. Sometimes all the original bone's gone and it's just the rock. Sometimes it's both. Uh, sometimes the actual bone itself is replaced by the minerals and the hollow spaces are also filled in different ways. So some fossils are light, some fossils are heavy, but in any case, there's some version of the original shape, the original anatomy, if it's a bone, still preserved. That's kind of your default. I'm definitely oversimplifying here. If you got into actually the science of fossilization, there's about a million terms we could use. But for you guys' purposes, this is like the usual thing that's happening, mineral infilling of negative spaces in the living tissue, a bone or shell or whatever. There's also really other uh, cool things that make fossils that are worth you guys seeing. And so one of the other ones is these unaltered remains. There are really rare cases where the organic remains of the organism are just straight up there. You have them still. And so here's a great example. This is from the tar pits in California. So this is not particularly old, but it's still a fossil. 14,000 years ago, there's a beetle. When they find these beetles, sometimes these beetles have been in these anoxic environments for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. When they break them open for a little second, the beetle's like still green or still purple before it oxidizes and becomes black like the tar is black. But that's still the original beetle's carapace, like preserved there, that's 14,000 years old. That extends to all kinds of very famous things, the permafrost, unlike tar pits, the permafrost, so up in the like Arctic, is where permafrost really is. Um, there's lots of ways you get relatively unaltered remains. This is unbelievable to me. This is the little face of a baby cave lion with its fur, with its like little eyeballs, even though they're all shrunk up and dried out. Here's a baby mammoth. Her name's Yuba, she's very famous. She still has milk in her stomach from her mother, which is really, really, really spectacular. So you guys will see pictures all the time, sometimes from Alaska and Canada, usually from Russia, of animals coming out of the permafrost. Now, just like the beetle, these are on the order of tens of thousands of years old, maybe hundreds of thousands of years old, but still sub-millions, which I know sounds like a long time. But there are examples that are millions and millions and millions and millions of years old. So a really famous example is in amber. That's like the mosquitoes from Jurassic Park, right? There are vertebrates that have been found in amber, but very far and away, the example you usually get are things like fossil plants, fossil pollen, fossil insects, fossil spiders and scorpions are a lot of what you find in amber. So amber is fossilized tree sap, just like when you touch a pine tree and it's sticky. If that gets buried, it can become a rock. It is itself a living fossil because it's the sap of a tree, but it might contain things like this, like beautiful little wasp that's like, 99 million years old, and you can look at that wasp like you just caught it in a bug net. Super, super awesome. A lot of times, hard shelled organisms, so these are some scallops, animals that make their shells out of like pretty solid chemical structures like calcium carbonate, they don't fossilize. Their shell just doesn't get destroyed. So you can get millions of years old seashells that look and feel just like regular seashells. It's just like this one's tens of millions of years old, which is really, really fun. I have found a handful in my life of dinosaur bones that have the same thing. They're not permineralized, they're empty of all their negative space, and it feels like and looks like a normal bone, but it's, in my case, I found some in Arizona, they're 200 some million years old. They're white, they look like bone, and they are the original bone from the dinosaur. because It's just a chemical, chemical structure of the bone that never got changed. Very cool. Also famous examples that are younger than that. This guy got preserved in a glacier. I only put him on here because he's kind of fun and interesting. Not a fossil, it's only 3,000 years old. Does anybody know Iceman? He was found in the base of the glacier. I didn't know about it until I watched the documentary on him that he has like an arrow embedded in his shoulder blade and like all these injuries. So like, yeah, he got messed up. <laughs> but he got preserved, right? So another kind of fossilization is called compression. So there's still bone in this fish that's permineralized like usual, but because of the intense pressure on the body, the carbon in the animal's soft tissues gets like stained onto the rock. And so you can get after some of like the gut contents, the internal anatomy, certainly the body outline of this fish beyond just the bone from things like compression. You'll see that quite a bit as we go through. Uh, another kind of fossilization that's really interesting and really helpful when we talk about things that are noble or unknowable are molds and casts. So the infilling of a negative space, a hollow of some kind that then forms into a rock because it gets filled with mud or filled with sand. And so this is a back of a skull of a mammal relative and the skull's broken here, and sediment has filled in where the brain used to be. And now if you break that skull open, there's a rock that's the exact same size and shape and has all the details of the outside, anyway, of that animal's brain. 
which is super cool. So natural endocasts happen all the time. Sometimes you get a, a, a cast like this, like this brain, and then around it, another kind of uh, fossil forms if the bone goes away. And so you get kind of this mold cast back and forth. Very cool. There's also these things, trace fossils, which I've mentioned already. So trace fossils aren't organic remains of the animal, they're traces. So here's a nice dinosaur footprint. I can be confident this dinosaur walks on three toes. Here's a burrow. We find these all the time. Here's the rock that was in that habitat. And then here's this like interesting tube shape in the rock that's filled with a different kind of rock. And sometimes if you think you found a burrow, you can look and on the sides of that tube of white rock, you'll see like scratch marks. Sometimes you'll find a little animal living right here, dead, like the skeletons at the end of the burrow. So we can talk about behavior because of this rock and that rock being a certain shape. Very, very cool. Um, skip through that for now. Yeah, let's call it for today because I don't want to keep you guys over. Like I said, I'll post some lectures uh, today for you to watch over the weekend and I will see you in lab on Monday. So thank you.